Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, honorable dignitaries, including, uh, I think many of the dignitaries have left, but we have here Her Excellency Daniel Muley, uh, senior journalist, Gajendra Puratokisi, and all the esteemed guests in the audience, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Nepal Institute for Policy Research for launching the second edition of the Nepal Competitive Index. I'd also like to thank them for having me over as a speaker during this special event. And without further ado, um, let me move on to the topic that was assigned to me, government and institutional setting. As an economist, uh, I'm not an expert in governance, uh, but economy is always tied to governance and institutions, so I will not be uh, speaking too far away from my uh, expertise because governance is part of everything. Um, and government, government and institutional setting was one of the four environments across which the Nepal Competitive Index rank, ranks the provincial government and it was presented earlier. Um, and as we all know, the term government is defined as the political system by which a country or community is administered and regulated. And if, when we have to define institutions, I want to remember the original institutional economist in the tradition of Thorsten Veblen and John R. Commons, who understood institutions as a special type of social structure with the potential to change agents, including changes to their purposes and preferences. So institutions are very powerful in the sense that they provide agency to stakeholders. And federalism as a governing system uh, was established in most of the developing countries, such as in Africa, in the post-colonial period, not only to promote national unity, but also to institute a system of governance. The concept of federalism became popular in both developed and developing countries after World War II especially in balancing power structure between federal and state or lower level governments and maintaining the governing system and strengthening institutional capacity. And much as half of the world's territory was governed by federalism by the end of 1960s. As a result, all levels of government were able to coordinate their actions in resolving national problems like the economic crises and civil rights struggles. And each country gradually adopted federalism to serve different purposes. For example, the United States adopted federal principles to safeguard the population from external attacks and to create wealth by increasing trade. Uh, Switzerland, on the other hand, uh, Her Excellency would know more, but uh, implemented it to exercise participatory democracy by establishing a representative system at the local level. Likewise, Brazil decentralized the functions of the existing centralized state using federalism. In the case of Nepal, the space for federalism expanded, and all of us are aware of this. Uh, in Nepal, the space for federalism expanded after the implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Accord of the 2006, and eventually in 2015, the federal constitution was promulgated. Nepal's constitution envisions an equitable and peaceful society, good governance, development and prosperity by ending all forms of discrimination and ensuring social justice based on inclusive and participatory proportional representation. The most pronounced change within Nepal's 2015 constitution was the establishment of provincial governments, uh, aka federalism, meaning we already have a federal government and local government, but we did not have the middle government or the provincial government, and the additional contribution of the 2015 constitution was the middle government or the provincial government. And Nepal's efforts to decentralize the government system and related economic activities across Nepal's newly formed provinces 
began shortly after the culmination of the first ever provincial and provincial elections. That was the election of 2017. And during the first five years since the formation, the seven provincial governments have laid the foundation of basic minimum policies, legislations, and institutional framework. Meaning the first five year, uh, years were spent institutionalizing federalism. And provinces have started formulating their own plans and budget. Provincial planning commissions and resource committees have been formed in almost all provinces by now. And despite these early building blocks during the first five years of federalism, general uncertainty and debate persists on the efficacy of the three-tiered federal governing system. Limited information and data about provincial governments make for an unclear picture of their performance. Nepal is very, Nepal's constitution is still very young and the governing system, uh, the new governing system, these are to be made better through research, dialogues, public discourses, etc. And these processes can be hindered by the provincial information and data gap. And in this context, I believe the Nepal competitive index can be seen as a departure point to contribute to the collective analysis of provincial governments across four environments and fill that data gap up to certain level. And if we look at the international context too, for example in India, the Niti Aayog in India tries to promote competitive federalism by facilitating improved performance of states. It encourages healthy competition among states through transparent rankings in various sectors, along with a hand-holding approach. Meaning, uh, the goal is not to leave states behind, but to move the states along together, hand-holding, strengthening each other. And some of the indices launched by Niti Aayog include School Education Quality Index, State Health Index, Composite Water Management Index, Sustainable Development Goals Index, India Innovation Index, Export Competitive Index, among others. And uh, the index uh, that NCI um, is working on and one of the environments or the indicators that's given to be the government and institutions. It is uh, the second environment analyzed under uh, Nepal Competitiveness Index. And it captures a picture of stability of the country's overall governance system and those related, key, uh, related to key public institutions. And some of the indicators of the sub-environments include government revenue, tax revenue. Uh, so there are 11 indicators and half of them are related to fiscal health of the provinces, including tax revenue, government expenditure, balance budget, etc. And the other half are related to institutions, uh, which includes the private sector institutions or the type of businesses that are registered under the provinces, uh, including limited companies, public limited companies, foreign companies, non-government organizations, etc. So both of these indicators, uh, on one hand, so the fiscal health of the uh, provinces, uh, on, and on the other hand, the actual institutions or the, these um, business bodies uh, show the economic health in terms of how many jobs are created in the provinces and how money is flowing nationally and internationally. So, uh, and earlier the presenter, I think Ms. Sato Basmuchare, uh, explained in detail about the methodology and um, uh, I was, in, in addition to um, calculating the ranking, I was happy to see that the research team also did a what if competitiveness analysis. So and this provides more uh, qualitative perspective and adds in one more layer to the study. And thank you for that. And it also helps uh, um, to answer the question like what needs to improve within the prov uh, provinces. So that was a uh, uh, you know, that was a good effort in your part and I 
uh, appreciate that. And I'm not, go I'm not going over the rankings um, as uh, Julia, Julia already presented that, but it was interesting to see that uh, like the rankings maybe were expected, but it was interesting to see how Modis was doing so well in terms of governance and his, especially in terms of governance, right? But given uh, they uh, are always speaking for the provincial government, right? So it is kind of expected too, but it's good to see that some of the provinces are actually doing better under the provincial governance system, right? So I was happy to see that. And another indicator uh, I was that was quite interesting to me uh, was the like you know governance when it comes to governance you know the issue of corruption is a big deal right and in order to address the issue of corruption one of the indicators uh, that was used in the in the report was number of court cases resolved. Uh, and, and that was tied to the instance of corruption, right? Number of court cases resolved over the year. So I found that quite impressive too. And uh, thanks for linking that to corruption because corruption is a big part of our governance system. And it's important that we, uh, you know, actually have indicators that show how well the country is doing. We have overall. Uh, corruption index that's published by the Transparency International, but we didn't, we did not have provincial indicators, and now we have it. So thank you for that as well, and I think that will be very beneficial for policy making as well as improving the governance point of view. And especially, you know, as an economist, um, I'm looking into public expenditure and infrastructure sector. And the main issue, yeah, why our infrastructure sector is lagging behind, why our country is not able to uh, spend as much money, especially the capital expenditure, is because of governance issues, right? So it's important that the report connects economic issues with governance issues. So in the future, with new reports, uh, I hope that you will uh, add indicators that are more localized and valuable. So to conclude, uh, so Nepal has completed the first five years institutionalizing federal governance. And um, during this first five years, uh, the province has put more focus on investment, uh, on identifying its province. So like the first five years was institutionalizing uh, federalism, but the next five years, the, the provincial government will put more focus on investment and identifying strengths of the provinces and potential industrial areas. So, in that towards that end, this report will be very useful, especially in the ongoing second term of the provincial governments. Um, so, so this in that sense, this report is very timely. And understanding the competitiveness of institutions will be mandatory in this second phase um, as they are a special type of social structure with the potential to change the agents. So in that sense also, understanding the strength of our strength and weaknesses of our institutions will be valuable uh, in this um, like next four or five years where the provincial governments uh, will be uh, spending more time planning for the economic growth of the provinces. So now I have a few suggestions uh, for the future, right? Because uh, as you mentioned earlier, this will be uh, like, uh, every, you, this will be uh, published every other year, right? So, um, so few suggestions. First of all, one of the indicators that was used uh, for government and institution environment was the balanced budget or budget balance, right? I know it's an important variable, but still, um, you know, we have to understand that uh, budget de deficit is not always a bad thing. So rather than emphasizing on balanced budget all the time, maybe we have to look at balanced budget in a counter-cyclical way, like you know, 
balancing the budget honestly clearly will be more relevant than just looking at balanced budget because sometimes uh, uh, for example like a couple of years ago our economy was going through covid-19 or earthquake during those adverse times it's imperative that the governments will spend more right and it's needed so during those years it is okay if we have you know if our government or provincial deficits goes up right but during normal times uh, budget deficit is not good so in that sense uh, in that sense uh, balancing the budget has to be counter cyclical in nature and um, oh, another suggestion so in addition to completely relying on quantitative methods right uh, it is important that the indicators are investigated using some qualitative methods such as in depth interviews focus group discussions participant observations uh, these qualitative methods will help add the human touch to the indicators, right? As well as it will provide in-depth insights. So it's important that we incorporate some qualitative methods. So that would be another. And my third suggestion would be learning from past mistakes, right? And here the example I'm giving, I believe you might have already guessed, right? So. Uh, we have to learn from, for example, the controversy surrounding World Bank's ease of doing business index, right? So, like, why was it questioned? Because of issues related to data transparency. So, right from the onset, it's imperative that data is transparent. So, I hope you put emphasis on that right from the onset. And last suggestion, right now, um, the Asian uh, so, the Nepal Competitive Index is uh, adopting Asian Competitive Framework, right? So, it's good that we are starting with some framework, right? But I hope in the future, we'll localize the index to Nepali context even more and we'll add some indicators and remove some if they are irre irrelevant. So, I hope, so I see this as a work in progress and I see that uh, it will improve over the years. So last, lastly, so best wishes to the research team in their future endeavors, and I wish you the best and congratulations on this important work. Thank you.